Okay, we're continuing with Dr. Vermel Green, uh, author of the book, Please Teach Me Like I'm a Boy. I don't know if you're familiar, Dr. Green, with Christina Hoff Summers. I am. I have her book right up here on my shelf, The War I've Against it, Boys. I've got it over there on my shelf. <laughs> <laughs> I actually met you. I met her, rather, and uh, she wrote a, a message to my wife on the on the jacket of the book, mm -hmm. your chauvinist husband. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to meet her for years. Um, I, I When I do workshops for teachers and parents, I show a video clip of her talking about, you know, the war on boys. And, and I have adopted her phrase, if boys are in trouble, so are we all. Exactly. Yeah, well, if you remember in the book, she talks about, her epiphany when she thought she was a feminist and she went to a meeting and she had just had a son and all these women are talking about how despicable all the men are. Mm -hmm. They hate them. And she realized, uh oh, they're talking about my son. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, right now, I don't know if you've been following, I think it was actually in Maryland there was an incident where a student, male student, was accused of rape, of course, after the fact, because he had text messages from the young lady. I use the term lady loosely. And uh, in the messages, she clearly solicited him for mm. relations. And the school found him guilty because he told her she was beautiful and therefore he flattered her and that was the same as rape. Craziness, craziness. I mean, are you seeing this? And does this mentality permeate in the black community as well? Well, um, I don't even try to speak for the black community. In, in many ways, my black brothers and sisters are uh, diametrically opposed. You know, I see myself first as a Christian and then as an American and then as a black person, as a black woman. And when I see the people in my church and even in my own family, you know, who are voting for people who kill our babies, you know, mm. Black babies, more so than any other race, disproportionately killed through abortion. When I see them voting for people who uh, don't support the families, the Black family is what helped us to survive slavery, Jim Crow, segregation. You know, the Black family was the hallmark. You know, where in the 1960s, I remember growing up, and I had a stepfather and my parents had um, divorced when I was just four and I had a stepfather. So my name was different from my mom and dad's. And I just felt, oh my goodness. I just felt, you know, oh, like a, anyway, I just, I just felt like an anomaly that, you know, my name was different from my parents because everybody lived with their mom and dad, you know? And unfortunately now, you know, 60 years later, it's the exact opposite, you know, where you have 73% of Black babies being born to single moms. You know, that's a recipe for disaster. Fatherlessness has decimated our Black communities, decimated our Black families, and especially our Black boys. And my heart breaks. Um, people asked me when I started my school, first of all, they said, well, when are you going to do something for the girls? I said, don't you realize this is for the girls? You know, right. we're raising right. up godly boys, you know, godly young men who are educated, who can provide for themselves and someone else, um, who are being taught how to open a door for their mom and, and respect the young lady. I said, this is for the girls. I said, in fact, I might rename my school. It was called Sacred Life Academy for Boys. And I said, I might put a subheading. The school for girls. <laughs> yeah. um, that's, that's a great concept. Yes, because 
these these young men aren't being taught. You know, usually that has that's the job of the father to teach these young men how to treat a woman. And the father does it by the son watching how he treats his mother. Uh, but when dad isn't around and when there's no one to step in, a mentor, a, a, a close uh, uh, uncle or grandfather or someone to step in to, to help him, you know, that that just doesn't happen. Um, in my school, my school for boys, um, I, I did my best bringing in men from our church, men from the community, politicians to come in to talk to our boys because I wanted them to model, you know, responsible manhood, godly manhood. I said, I can teach them how to read and write, but I can't teach them how to be a man. So I would ask the men to come in and work with my boys, volunteer, mentor them, and show them just what it meant to be a man in this day. I believe it was Freud who said that um, because a woman is the primary nurturer in utero, and then even when the baby is born, still is the primary nurturer. Initially, the boy bonds with his mother, but there has to come a point in a few years where the boy will transfer that bonding to his father. And if there isn't a father, it becomes problematic. I mean, there are many admirable women that do the best they can because they pick the wrong man mm -hmm. to child with. But no matter what, they still can't be a man. And hopefully right. they'll be an uncle. Or... I always believe that those gangs that so many kids join, they join those gangs because that gives them a concept, although it's distorted, of family and of right. manly behavior. And maybe the only place where they have that model. I don't know, how do you feel about that? I wholeheartedly agree that the gangs gave them a sense of belonging. Uh, unfortunately, as you said, also the negative, the negative concepts, you know, where I'm a man because of how many babies I father or I'm a man, depending upon how many people I kill or hurt. I'm a man if I can walk around with a wad of bills in my pocket that I've gotten from selling drugs or from other nefarious ways. Um, so that whole distortion. But Bob, I think you would agree with me that this is truly a spiritual problem, more so than a social problem. Um, you know the story, of course, of Moses and uh, the Pharaoh said, there's too many Hebrews. Throw the boy babies into the river. And I remember hearing that story as a child and thinking, well, if there's too many. Why are you just killing the boy babies? Why not the girls too? Because Pharaoh knew, because the same devil that's here now was there. You destroy the males of a culture. You decrease their numbers and you weaken the whole culture. The culture then can be more easily controlled. You can control the women and the girls, you can control that. And that's when I got in trouble. When I told that story, I followed up with the statement that men are the strength of our culture. They fight our wars, they lead our families, they build our buildings. You know, that's why, you know, our, our society is, is crumbling because it's not recognizing the fact that our men must be strong our men must be able to, to uh, father their children, to be a part, an integral part of their families. We must, we must save our fathers. And when we make them out to be buffoons or idiots, when we you know, denigrate them in media and in situation comedies, we are hurting ourselves. And especially these little boys, you know, who are looking at what they're gonna become and they see, well, I'm just gonna grow up, I'm gonna be an idiot, I'm gonna be you know, stupid, my children will be able to run circles around me. No, um, even though those of us who grew up in the 50s, like you and I grew up in the 50s and do father knows best and leave it to Beaver, the father was always portrayed as strong. And when Beaver had a problem, 
he went to his father, you know, my three sons, the father was the strong one. And even bless his heart, Bill Cosby, <laughs> no <laughs> issues. Still, his yeah. program showed strong black fathers, you know, professional yeah. fathers, who again, whose children, if they had an issue, they came to him or they came to their mother. You know, so these portrayals of families, they're just not out there now. You know, exactly. I've gotten to the point now where I don't even want to watch television because, in fact, I've gotten rid of the cable and whatever. I said, no, I don't even want to see it. Because, and one other thing, and then I'm going to stop talking and let you talk. This, one of my favorite programs used to be um, America's Funniest Videos. And then part of it, they would spend a good five minute segment in each program showing groin kicks men being kicked in the groin. And the audience just thought that was the funniest thing. Ha, 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 ha. Well, hey, if they turned around to be bosom kicks on women, <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, there'd be, there'd be an uproar. Always are men the brunt of jokes and it should not be. One of my wife's pet peeves is they always show now women beating up the men. Mm. Petite women who weigh maybe 110 pounds are beating the heck out of a muscled 200 pound man. And to show you how the women have been brainwashed, I was getting a haircut and it wasn't the usual barber. And I was just talking to her casually and I was talking about what's happening now with the transgender nonsense of men now calling themselves women and beating all the women in all the sports that require strength and speed. And she says to me, how dare you say that? Ooh. She said, you're totally wrong. There are plenty of women that could beat, because I use Mike Tyson as, a, as an example. There are many women who could beat up Mike Tyson. Oh, really? <laughs> and she stormed out of the cutting room and told the manager that she will not continue to cut my hair. Because, wow. Because I said that Mike Tyson could beat any woman boxer quite easily. Wow. <laughs> so you can't even say that Mike Tyson would win a fight against a woman. <laughs> First of all, I commend you on your courage. To say that to a woman with scissors and a razor in her hand. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully she wasn't doing a circumcision. <laughs> oh my. Oops. <laughs> that yeah. Sorry. But you know, you, know you, you gotta have guts. And I and I don't know if you notice this, but women now will come over to men and start telling them off or bossing them around. And the men actually become intimidated. And I, I was having a beer with a friend of mine in a bar. He invited me to come in and buy, he wanted to buy me a beer. Okay, I don't even like beer, but just socially, I okay, I'll drink a beer. And I used the word homo Ooh. with this man. And there was a woman behind me eavesdropping. And she said, you can't say that. I turned around. I said, oh, oh really? Uh, did I invite you into this conversation? <laughs> and uh, she said, they are, they are gay. I said, well, I don't see anything happy about it. <laughs> and she was so shocked that I wouldn't give in. And this is the same thing I get all the time with, for example, white liberals. A few months ago, I was on a train talking to a friend, a railroad, Long Island Railroad, and we were talking about the Trayvon Martin case with George Zimmerman. And I was simply relating the actual facts of that event. So a white woman, sitting behind me says to me, 
I heard what you're saying. I said, oh, congratulations. I guess you have ears. She said, you're a racist. I said, I'm a racist? Because of the facts that I just relayed? I said, lady, where do you live? She says, I live in Roslyn. I said, oh, and I suppose when you moved to Roslyn, you didn't know what the demographics of that neighborhood was. And you didn't know that there are virtually no black people that live in that neighborhood. If I'm the racist, why are you living in an all white area? Why don't you move to the South Bronx where I come from, mm -hmm. Harlem? Why don't you move there if you're such a non-racist and I'm a racist? But you see, when you, when you get in their face that way, they now realize, uh-oh, I'm not gonna intimidate this person anymore. I, I better back off. The problem is we get intimidated, whether it's by race. I mean, I follow these incidents and they're just, especially in the schools. There's a kid here that the children in the school turned him into the principal. In other words, where I come from, we call it ratting him out. Or snitching, the kids say it now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why? Because he wrote on his social media, which occurred at home at night, that the only people discriminated against are white men. That's what he wrote. And these white kids took that post, brought it to the school administration, and they brought charges against him for expressing his honest, sincere opinion. Eventually, he just dropped out of school. They actually served him with legal papers with a professional process server for nonsense like that. And they're training, I don't know if you see it, I imagine you do, they're training these kids to rat people out, not for something serious, like an armed robbery or a murder. That Whether they brought a gun to school, oh, nothing oh. like that. Yeah, let, Jack, let's get into that a little bit. Let's talk about the shootings and what's going on with these kids and how the solution is to take the screwdriver away from the handyman rather than control the handyman. We are so quick to treat the symptom and not get at the root problem. Uh, when the founders gave us a constitution and that second amendment, they said that we would have that right to bear arms not so much to be able to protect ourselves from robbers and thieves and whatever, but from the government, you know, right. a tyrannical government that would prey upon a defenseless citizenry. Uh, that's what's happening in Australia, Venezuela. The first thing they did was they took away their guns and they have no recourse. And in Canada, um, they just did nail the, put the nail in the coffin and once more when Trudeau says no handguns. So um, this is not gonna solve violence in our schools. If someone deranged wants to hurt people, there's other ways that they can do it. I read a recent article of someone, I think it was in um, Scandinavia, he was, killing people with a bow and arrow and a machete, you know, killing people in a store. So it's going to happen. It would be better instead of blaming the guns and start blaming the individuals, holding them responsible. The schools should do a better job of protecting their kids. Um, I find that uh, it's very interesting that the schools in Israel, I was reading, since 1974, okay, that's um, almost 50 years, they've had six, one, two, three, four, five, six school shootings in 50 years. 
Right. In Israel, they know how to protect their children. You know, and we need to adopt some of those ways to protect our children before we start jumping on the bandwagon to get rid of guns. Because I saw I saw a very good movie about Jews that don't have guns. It's called Schindler's List. Ooh. Wow. Those Jews had no guns. That you're exactly right. Add to that list, like I said, Australia and Canada and Venezuela, Germany, Nazi Germany. They took away their guns. Yeah, there's a very good um, book called The Global Gun Grab, written by a friend of mine, William Norman Grigg. And in the book, he has the cable that Goebbels sent to Hitler after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which was the one of the few times that Jews were able to get just a few smuggled weapons into the Warsaw Ghetto, and they held off the German army for a long time with Molotov cocktails and handmade uh, zip guns. They used to call that in my old neighborhood, zip gun. It looks like a pen. Mm-hmm. Uh, could you imagine if you had a million Jews with AR-15s? Wow. It would, would not be that have... easy to kill them. That's no. for sure. No, it wouldn't. And, and of course, who are the people most in favor of taking away guns? Jews in this country. Wow. Interesting. Because their, their allegiance is not to the Torah or the Bible. Their allegiance is to communism and socialism. Those are the Jews I spoke to you in our private conversation about who have Jewish sounding names. And so people look at them as Jews, but if you don't believe in what the Torah says, then really, you know, what are you? I don't care what religion you claim or, you know, what color you are because a lot of people don't realize if you go to Israel, Jews come in all colors. There are many black Jews, many in Israel who serve nobly in the Israeli Defense Force. Many unfortunately have been killed in common. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually got along better with them anytime I go to Israel than anybody else because their views are very much right wing. They're the most right wing because they have common sense, which is uncommon. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Dr. Green, it is an absolute joy to you. Uh, I hope we can stay in touch. Um, and have you seen the very popular, uh, it's on the internet, but this guy used to be on mainstream TV. It's Jason Whitlock. He has a show called Fearless. He's a black man who has a regular plethora of guests. Most of them are black, but many of them are white also. Um, and this guy, you can see why he's no longer on mainstream TV. He's a Christian, but he has terrific, terrific people. And you need to get with these people because you would be perfect on that show um, because they, they are fearless. They speak out and they don't care what color you are or what religion you claim to be of or what tribe you claim to come from. They are telling the truth. And one of the things he has uh, really accentuated on his show is what they've done to black men. Mm -hmm. Turn black men to a bunch of whiners and crybabies. Um, I don't know if you know what happened in New York with the New York Yankees and mm -hmm. the black baseball player from the Chicago White Sox. Oh, it's a big thing. <laughs> a white player named Josh Donaldson, who's a New York Yankee, was playing against the Chicago White Sox. And um, Anderson is the name of the White Sox black player. 
and gave an interview in Sports Illustrated. And he said, I'm the new Jackie Robinson, mm. which I thought was a little bit of chutzpah, you know, that, <laughs> you know, because you don't, when you're talking about a, an icon, you're humble enough to don't compare yourself. Right. Saying, I'm the new Moses, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be that bold to say that. And so all players, they rib each other all the time. And the white ball players said to him, how you doing, Jackie? Because he had called himself Jackie Robinson. Right. So right away, they turned that into a racial incident. And it was tantamount to him having used the N-word. And all the white sportcasters and all the white executives on TV, in the corporate world, fell over themselves attacking the white player who never meant anything racial. If you tell me that you're the next uh, Cicely Tyson, and I say, how you doing, Cicely? That's not a racial insult. No. It's, it's normal kidding that goes between people, people kid each other all the time. Right. Go crying over any kind of imagined nonsense, but it draws attention to him by claiming he's a victim of racism. And one of the sports writers, who unfortunately is Jewish from Sports Illustrated, said that that man has to go through the oppression of Band-Aids on his leg that are not black. A Band-Aid that she claimed was a racial discriminatory affront, the color of a Band-Aid. This is how pathetic it is. And they fined him and suspended him. He did nothing wrong. What? Oh my. And he said, Listen, I never meant to insult him or to race was the last thing on my mind. But if he was insulted, I humbly apologize. Now, I never would apologize for that. But he apologized. No, that's not good enough. They have to beat him with a whip some more. And he just has to take it. And this is the problem. And I don't think it's a black problem. I think it's a white problem. I think white people are cowards. I think white people are not men anymore. I think they're spineless wimps. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, I have to try to make up for all of that. <laughs> <laughs> so try to get in touch with them. Go on Facebook or go on YouTube and put in Fearless, Jason Whitlock. I am telling you that you should be a regular guest. And I'm going to also try to communicate with them because they've got some terrific people. And, you know, you, you are one of the best kept secrets that I've encountered in my various sojourns through meeting so many people. And I mean that, I mean that. Dr. Green, you are fabulous. Oh, thank you, Bob. Thank and you in, so much for having in, me. In the Jewish language, there's a word, you may have heard it called mensch. Mm -hmm. Mensch means it's a very high compliment. It means like a real person, mm -hmm. a real human being of quality. You, Dr. Green, are a mensch. Oh, thank you. And may God bless you and may your tribe multiply in diametric proportions. And he has blessed me and my tribe is growing. So thank you. Thank you for those blessings. I definitely receive them. All right. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you.